Uh, we're delighted to welcome Professor Seamus Miller, who will be speaking on criminal investigators and moral responsibility. Uh, Professor Miller has degrees from the Australian National University, from Oxford, from Rhodes, and also Melbourne. Uh, he is professor of philosophy at Charles Sturt University. He's also a senior research fellow at the Center for Ethics and Technology at the Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He has been the head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Charles Sturt University, also foundation director of the Center for Applied Ethics and Public Ethics. Uh, he is very, very widely published, particularly on topics in social action and institutions, on terrorism, business ethics, and police ethics. He has a very, very considerable body of work on applied ethics in several contexts. He's been awarded numerous competitive grants and consultancies. Uh, just a couple of the several books that he has written, Institutional Corruption, A Study in Applied Philosophy, Cambridge University Press, and Investigative Ethics, uh, published by Blackwell. And um, we're delighted that he's here to speak to us on a topic that is right at the core of interest of this institution. So welcome and thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, John, and thanks very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Um, I have visited John Jay on a number of occasions, um, and we have a, actually a reasonably close relationship with, uh, between my university and John Jay, and that uh, we have uh, Professor Kleinig here who spends half, half the year with us and half the year uh, uh, here. So uh, this talk is uh, somewhat philosophical, but I hope... Um, is, is of interest to practitioners uh, as well. It, uh, I guess the main source is that book uh, mentioned by John, Investigative Ethics. Uh, that's um, actually forthcoming. Um, what I thought I might do to talk about moral responsibility of criminal investigators is just start off with a, a quick kind of case study to give us a, a little bit of uh, focus. Uh, and it's quite a famous one. Um, namely the, the Yorkshire Ripper Inquiry. Uh, this involved Peter Sutcliffe was finally identified as the Ripper. Uh, he was um, engaged in, in stalking and, um, and murdering and assaulting and so on, uh, particularly prostitutes in Yorkshire in the, in the 70s and up into the early 80s. And he was eventually convicted of 13 counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. Um, however, one of the interesting features of this from the point of view of what I want to talk about today is that there are um, various shortcomings in the, in the investigations, um, including in relation to the, the database, uh, in fact, which was a non-computerized database that was used, um, and also some of, the, some of the judgments made by individual officers on particular occasions uh, left something to be desired. Um, and this is important for, I think, for the notion of moral responsibility as it's to be understood in the context of criminal investigators, um, which is, of course, my, um, my topic. Now, just very quickly, I, I don't want to have a lengthy discourse on what moral responsibility is, but um, roughly speaking, we, we would presumably hold someone morally responsible for some action or, or omission if they intentionally performed that action and their intention was uh, more or less under their control and the action was morally significant. Now, that obviously is not a complete account of moral responsibility and it leaves out things like outcomes that one might know about without intending and so on and so forth. Um, at any rate, it's a sort of rough and ready notion because I want to talk about extensions of it with respect to um, what, I'm calling, what I'll call epistemic action as opposed to ordinary behavioural action. Um, so Sutcliffe was clearly responsible for, uh, in this sense, morally responsible for murdering 13 women. And that's as, let's refer to that as kind of behavioural action as opposed to action 
um, that has knowledge as an outcome, which I'll refer to as epistemic action. I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. So on the one hand, we've got a kind of standard idea of moral responsibility uh, for the performance of an action by an individual. On the other hand, if we, if we think about the detectives and, and the various other police and, and other personnel in, involved in this, in this investigation, um, there were different people doing different things, presumably all with a, with a, a, toward a collective purpose, namely identifying the Yorkshire Ripper. So who is the Yorkshire Ripper? Um, and it was very much, a, as it were, a team perspective, or in fact, different teams at different points. There was the West Yorkshire Police, the, the Met got involved at one point, and it was a complicated um, matter. But the investigation of murder um, is, if you like, a team operation. And so it involves different people in a certain division of labour, people in the forensic area, other people doing interviewing, and so on and so forth. Um, and so the question, the key question I'm, I want to ask here is, well, who is responsible for, for bringing Sutcliffe to, mur to, to, uh, to justice or, or for failing to do so? Or who is responsible for the various uh, mistakes that were made um, in, in, the, in the course of this investigation? Um, is it just individuals or it looks as though there were various sorts of collective failures? And so the issue that arises, given that uh, murder is a, a clearly a morally significant matter is the, the question arises of uh, the collective moral responsibility uh, of the detectives and, and others. And uh, the question I'm a I want to ask here at this point is, uh, what is actually collective moral responsibility and how is it to be understood in these contexts? Um, the second kind of notion that I want to get on the table uh, and talk about is what I'll refer to as the chain of moral responsibility. Um, so let's assume, uh, and I don't really want to get into too many arguments about what the, the collective end of detectives is or ought to be, uh, and there's various disputes around this, but let's assume, um, for argument's sake, that the detectives are collectively morally responsible for gathering evidence that identified um, the Ripper as, uh, as Sutcliffe. Let's, let's just... Uh, take that as, 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 as a given. But if we reflect on it, of course, that was only the beginning of a process which ended up, in fact, with a, uh, once it had been determined that he was, he was not insane and so on, it ended up that he went before a jury and the jury members, for example, um, were key in trying and convicting him of murder. So they were part of that process that ended up, as it were, in Sutcliffe being, let me refer to it briefly, um, and simplistically as bringing um, Sutcliffe to justice. Um, now, given that the jury performed its activities after uh, the, uh, the detectives had prepared the evidence and the brief was provided and so on and so forth, and the various other actors, but for our purposes here, we don't need to worry too much about that. If we ask ourselves, what is the responsibility of the detectives uh, and again, collectively, um, what are they morally responsible for in the process of bringing Sutcliffe to justice, bearing in mind that, remember, they were not the people who tried and convicted him. So um, the question that arises then is what I'm referring to as a chain of moral responsibility. So the detectives are, as it were, the gathering evidence phase, and they presumably collectively are responsible for that phase. Uh, and we need to say a little bit more about what collective moral responsibility is. But then we've got another phase, which is, as a, at the very least, a kind of temporal uh, part of a process where the question as arises as to what extent uh, the detectives might be responsible for the ultimate outcome, namely that um, Sutcliffe was, you know, was, given, was tried and convicted and given a life sentence, or multiple life sentences, actually. Um, in what sense are they responsible collectively for that outcome um, is my second question. And this is a question I take it to be about what I'll refer to as the chain of moral responsibility. Um, the next kind of issue that I want to get on the table is one I've just foreshadowed earlier, which is, um, as it were, epistemic action and responsibility, and, and in particular moral responsibility, 
for epistemic action or action which is directed to the acquisition of knowledge. So we can make a rough and ready distinction between, as it were, behavioural action, which is to say uh, me walking around um, beating someone over the head, Sutcliffe um, hitting someone over the head with a hammer, um, that's behavioural outward uh, action. But on the other hand, a lot of action is epistemic action in the sense it's action directed to the acquisition of knowledge where without going into too much detail about what knowledge is, presumably it's in the first instance true belief and true belief for which someone you have some kind of justification or something. Um, now if you look at the Sutcliffe um, uh, episode, um, poor judgment at the very least was made on a number of occasions. He was interviewed, I think it was nine times during the course of uh, the process, the, over the years. Uh, he was on in the data bank for having committed various offences, including assault and, and stalking, I think, and sort of various other things. But these weren't picked up um, by the system, which was a manual, uh, manual based system. There wasn't a computerized system. So that was um, one, one kind of issue. Another kind of issue that, that on particular occasions it looks as though individual officers uh, made poor judgment. So he's picked up on one occasion, he was sort of stalking prostitutes and he had a hammer in his, and various other things in his possession uh, and he was charged with um, going, equipped to ski, going equipped to steal uh, uh, and evidently the, the officers in question didn't, didn't really look at the matter sufficiently closely and, and, and made a poor judgment. Um, do we then say that the police officer who made that judgment is, is in some sense morally responsible or at least is in the first instance is, is responsible for failing to acquire a piece of knowledge that uh, perhaps he, he should have acquired and given that it's a morally significant piece of knowledge that's in play is he morally responsible for failing uh, to acquire that knowledge in that context? Now, that doesn't is not, of course, the same thing as to say that he's morally responsible for the deaths that actually followed the release of Sutcliffe, of which there were a number. Um, was the police officer morally responsible for his epistemic failure? And indeed, this is my third question, uh, what is um, epistemic responsibility, and specifically, what is moral epistemic responsibility? Um, and going back to my first, my first issue was collective moral responsibility. My second issue was the chain of responsibility, moral responsibility. My third, third issue is uh, responsibility, moral responsibility for epistemic failure or, or indeed success. Uh, and so if you put, the, put these two things together, we've now got uh, uh, a question about collective moral responsibility for e epistemic uh, success or failure, where the epistemic, that is the knowledge in question, is morally significant. Now, um, if you think about murder investigations, they involve, uh, they generate a huge volume of information, particularly if you're talking about serial, um, serial murderers, serial rapists, and uh, the manual systems of the past, including the one they had in place for the Ripper inquiry, were hopelessly inadequate. Uh, so he was actually, Sutcliffe was actually in the data bank in, in, in a num at a number of points and the cross-referencing simply wasn't done. Um, so the issue of collective responsibility in relation to such a system uh, comes into play, the designers, the users, the poor, poor use of, the outcomes uh, are good, then presumably the people are collective responsibility, they have collective responsibility and, and can be uh, praised for their work if if there's failure perhaps they can be um, uh, blamed or, or, or condemned or something or taken to task so the issue here then becomes the collective moral responsibility for for epistemic success or uh, uh, epistemic failure okay so there's three key notions that I think we need to get on the table the target of course is to get some understanding of moral responsibility of criminal investigators that's the ultimate target but I think there's at least the th three theoretical notions that we need to get a handle on if we're going to sensibly uh, answer that question uh, to, and just to remind you their collective moral responsibility detectives engaged in a team enterprise the chain of moral responsibility, the detectives do their part in an institutional process which is then taken up and 
and, and pursued further by, for example, a jury in, in, a, in a courtroom setting. And then you've got the fact that there's epistemic at various points as opposed to behavioural responsibility, and specifically if the detective's task is to, is to unearth, provide evidence and, and determine um, the identity of the Yorkshire Ripper, then it, that is principally an epistemic task, even though, of course, it involves uh, various behavioural actions in the process, such as you know, picking up uh, the hammer and sticking it in a bag and so on and so forth. Okay, so let me just say a few things about each of these notions, um, and that's what I'm going to do now, and uh, do so in the context of, a, of criminal investigators, and we'll see how far I get. Um, as I understand it, I've got another 15 minutes or so, would that be? Yeah, a bit more, okay, good. All right, so let me, let me begin with the last concept, which was uh, epistemic responsibility. Um, and this is quite important because a lot of philosophers have suggested that uh, beliefs are not under our control, that um, uh, we come to believe things, um, as it were, but not voluntarily. We can't simply decide, for example, to believe something. Uh, so we arrive at beliefs. And so the question arises, since we're talking about knowledge and epistemic, and I've been talking about epistemic action, which is action directed at knowledge, how can you hold people responsible for knowledge, if knowledge is something like justified true belief or something, uh, how can we hold them responsible and specifically morally responsible if it's the case that beliefs are not under one's control, as is uh, standardly argued in, in philosophy? Um, okay, well, epistemic, let, let me say a few things about this. Epistemic actions are actions of acquiring true belief or knowledge. Um, and there's various different methods for acquiring true belief uh, or knowledge. Uh, observation, testimony and so on are ones that are heavily involved in the, in the criminal justice process. Uh, and so a detective investigating a series of murders um, uses these methods or members of the team use some of these methods um, and presumably uh, it's epistemic action insofar as it's action just to simplify um, we're trying to acquire the knowledge with respect to the question, who is the Yorkshire Ripper? And the knowledge, of course, involves not just simply uh, a true belief that, say, Peter Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper, but having uh, the justification in the form of a elaborate uh, evidence to, that, to, to back that up and in, an evidence to a certain standard. Um, Okay, so I suggest that coming to uh, truly believe a proposition, let's say the proposition that Peter Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper, um, uh, on the basis of evidence, is action in at least three respects. In the first place, someone goes out there and intentionally <coughs> gathers evidence, having as a, an end or goal to know who the Yorkshire Ripper is, the physical evidence, interviews, people in the vicinity of the attack and so on. Um, so in the first place, I think we can say, well, this is action, and it's action directed to a, an epistemic end, I mean knowledge. So that's the first sense in which it's reasonable, it seems to me, to refer to what the detectives is doing as epistemic action. Um, and what essentially is going on here is that you've got an agent, in this case a detective or a team of detectives, uh, who are making a decision um, that they will come to have a true belief with respect to some matter, in this case the identity of the Yorkshire Ripper, as opposed to their current situation, which is that they don't actually have any belief uh, one way or the other because they don't know who the, the Ripper is. So that's the first state, uh, in se first sense in which there's a decision. There's a decision to move out of a state of ignorance uh, into a state of knowledge by, by way of um, gathering evidence and so on. The second uh, sense <coughs> which I suggest that uh, we, we perform actions um, is in this area is in terms of mental acts, where someone intentionally, let's say a detective, intentionally makes inferences from some pre-existing network of beliefs uh, to some conclusion. Now, in the case of just, just simplifying, in the case of the, the Ripper inquiry, there was a lot of um, inference making and um, and uh, developing of lines of inquiry and so on and so forth around the modus operandi. I mean, there seemed to be a particular modus operandi, there seemed to be a particular 
set of targets, namely prostitutes, and of course ultimately and it was a given area and, and they mapped the area and it, uh, the centre of that area was where he lived and so on and so forth. So what you actually had is uh, a complex uh, inference making process uh, and it seems quite reasonable um, to claim that that inference making process um, is uh, directed to knowledge and that it is epistemic action. Um, since the agents in question intentionally uh, embarked on that inference making process. Um, sorry, I'm getting, I'm not getting ahead of myself, I'm getting behind myself, which is. Uh, so that's the, the second uh, sense in which uh, there can be epistemic action. The third uh, sense, I suggest, is actually. Um, the making of an all things considered judgment at the end of any such process of weighing and gathering and evidence. Um, at some point, various people, uh, various police officers, various, and, and indeed for that matter, uh, others, uh, as it were, made the judgment, the judgment based on evidence, that indeed Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper as opposed to for example, the judgment that Sutcliffe is not the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, and they, in making that judgment, had as an end the, the truth of the matter. Um, so here we have a case of deciding, I suggest, between believing that P and believing that not P. Um, but of course, and this is, if, this is critical, the, the person making that judgment is not and is, is not and cannot be deciding to believe what is false. That's not what's going on. Um, they're making a judgment, but they're making a judgment in the context of necessarily aiming at the truth. It's just that they're not, it's not clear what the truth is, um, or at least up until a certain point, it's not clear what the truth is. So it seems to me that uh, notwithstanding the fact that the detective is, is not deciding to believe what he thinks is false, that, that's pretty difficult, um, if not impossible. Um, nor is the detective deciding that Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper, irrespective of the evidence. I mean, it's not as if they're making a judgment uh, and, and bracketing uh, the evidence, at least in the, in the standard um, case. What they're doing is they're making a judgment that Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper on the basis of the evidence. And that seems to be, in a perfectly ordinary sense, um, an action. It has, a, it has an end, uh, namely uh, knowledge with respect to whether or not uh, Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire Ripper. And it's based on evidence. Um, and that seems to me to be um, a perfectly reasonable and third sense in which someone is performing an epistemic action. Now the next point I want to make is that since that since those actions of the ones I've just mentioned, the, the, the decision to go and find out who the Yorkshire Ripper is, the inference making process, and then the final, as it were, all things considered judgment, are matters of moral significance. And since, as I've argued, they're actions for which the, uh, the detective or detectives can be held responsible, we can hold them presumably morally responsible. Recall the definition, rough and ready definition of moral responsibility as being performing an action intentionally um, uh, that is morally significant. And presumably uh, these actions, if any, are, are morally significant. So therefore we can hold that the detective in making the judgment that on the basis of evidence that Sutcliffe is the Yorkshire River can be held morally responsible for that. And in this instance, given that he was the Yorkshire River, praised for it. Of course, if they get it wrong, therefore uh, blamed for it. Um, on the other hand, perhaps we can uh, also uh, blame certain officers at certain points um, who failed to make judgments that they really ought to have made, given uh, the evidence that they had and um, their experience and so on and so forth. Um, and given that their judgments in those contexts, uh, were, they were morally significant contexts. Okay, so, so much for epistemic action. So that, that's my offering 
in relation to the first, uh, or it was actually the third question. I've still got two questions left. Um, the second question was uh, collective moral responsibility. And our collective moral responsibility is a complicated notion and it takes different forms in different contexts. But um, what I want to do here is just suggest that in, these co in the context of interesting, that interest us here, a team of detectives, let's say, uh, or a jury, uh, that's another example, um, they're essentially can be understood as joint actions, which is to say that two or more individuals perform actions intentionally uh, or, or intentionally refrain from performing actions, um, and they're directed toward a collective end. So a team of detectives investigating a series of murders, uh, that can be understood in a rough already sense as a joint, joint action. It's a bunch of individuals performing particular actions uh, to realise an end that each of them has, namely um, the identity, and this, let's keep working with the same example, the identity of the Yorks are Ripper. So they involve, I suggest, joint actions, collective ends. So two or more agents have the same end. Uh, let's, um, to identify the, the Yorkshire Ripper, uh, each agent performs an individual action, supposing one agent may be interviewing this witness, some other, uh, some other uh, person involved may be looking at some forensic evidence, um, but it's all in the service of the collective end to identify the Yorkshire Ripper. Uh, and notice that um, not only is there a collective end, an end that each of them has, and, it, and not only do that's consistent with them each performing individual actions in the service of the same end, but there's also interdependence, right? In other words, the, the people who are interviewing are, are doing so to some extent uh, conditional on the other, on, in the knowledge that the other people are doing the forensics and so on and so forth, uh, since it's highly unlikely that they're going to realise their collective end unless the different members of the team do their respective parts. Okay, so we've got joint action, and now we could talk about behavioural joint action, in other words, a, a bunch of people trying to win a game of soccer, they're running around the place kicking a ball and so on, they're all trying to win. Um, but there can be joint epistemic action um, where the collective end in question is an epistemic end, that is its knowledge. And this seems to me to be precisely the case with detectives. They're not just engaged in joint behavioural action, although there's a certain amount of that going on. They're actually focused on joint epistemic action uh, because they're trying to figure out uh, a piece of knowledge, an answer to a question, who is the Yorkshire Ripper? And so each of the agents, again, performs some contributory epistemic actions. You know, this piece of evidence suggests this, this DNA evidence, whatever. Um, and there's interdependence, again, in this instance, uh, in, uh, not simply behavioural, but epistemic interdependence. Um, I'm going to be seeking this piece of knowledge uh, with respect to the information given to be, uh, uh, to be extracted from this witness, but on condition that you're doing your bit in the forensic laboratory or whatever. Um, now, critically, um, the last dot point, um, there is a, a crucial difference between, as it were, joint behavioural action and joint epistemic action, uh, and in particular with, the na with respect to the nature of the collective end. Because in the case of behavioural stuff, as it were, at least typically, the, you know what the collective end is. Uh, in other words, if you're playing um, uh, soccer or something, you know that what you're trying to do is have more goals than the, the opposite team or some such. You know, you know what the, the content of the collective end is. Whereas, of course, in joint epistemic action or in epistemic action generally, you're aiming at knowledge with respect to some matter, but it's precisely the content that you don't know. <laughs> well, that's what you're trying to figure out, um, what the content is, um, whether or not this person is the Yorkshire Ripper or who the Yorkshire Ripper is. You, you don't know the content, and that's... Um, precisely what you're trying to find out. Okay, so the final context, the final, um, so that's my story about uh, collective responsibility, um, epis and that, uh, that's, you've now got my story about epistemic action and you've got my story about collective um, responsibility, uh, including collective moral responsibility for epistemic, joint epistemic actions. Um, and how it, it might apply to the detective's case and, and therefore how we might be able to um, ascribe moral responsibility individually, collectively to a team and also 
um, uh, epistemic responsibility, which is, which is also moral, given the significance of the knowledge in question. So my finally, the third issue that I promised you I would say something about was the um, chain of moral responsibility. Um, and let me conclude with a few remarks about that. And you'll recall that the idea there was that the, the detectives are doing, trying to figure out the identity of the Yorkshire Ripper. That's, that's great. But then that comes to an end. They've done their piece. They've done their bit. Um, the prosecutors decided to go ahead with it and so on and so forth. They're, they're, you know, and now we're in the courtroom setting and, and so on and so forth. And let's say, just to simplify, the, of course, there's the prosecutor and there's the various law. But the, let's say the jury now makes the, the decision, guilty or not guilty or whatever. So we've now got, that's a collective uh, matter, uh, and they make uh, an epistemic decision of sorts, presumably, um, although it has, as it were, behavioural <laughs> ramifications. Um, so what's the relationship between the end point of the process, um, let's say, to keep things simple, um, the conviction of Sutcliffe for all those murders, that's the end point of the, of the process that commenced with the detectives identifying the Yorkshire Ripper um, as Peter Sutcliffe. Uh, in what sense, if any, are the, is my question, are the detectives, presumably collectively, morally responsible for that final outcome? I mean, it's, it's easy enough to understand that they're collectively morally responsible for identifying Sutcliffe, they provide the evidence, the, the brief, and so on and so forth, that goes forward. But is that the end of it, or can we say that there's some responsibility uh, on the part of the detectives with respect to the final outcome? Um, and we'd be interested to hear from some former detectives as to whether or not they think they have any responsibility for that outcome, and if, if so, uh, why?